waiting for the thumbs up back. Okay. Um, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll, I'll kick off. So this, um, this is a, a GStreamer tutorial on, on um, how to use GStreamer. Uh, the goal this afternoon is to explain for anyone that doesn't know about GStreamer what it is and to provide some introduction to the framework, to the tools that are available and how to use or make your own applications um, and introduce perhaps how you might extend GStreamer yourself to show some techniques for debugging applications that are based on GStreamer and hopefully give you all some kind of grounding in how to make multimedia, how to do transformations and things. Um, and if I'm lucky, encourage people to file bugs and come back uh, and contribute. So there are some simple house rules for the afternoon. This is a tutorial where I'm hoping that everybody will learn. So if I am failing to understand, uh, to, to explain anything clearly, uh, or I've glossed over something, please interrupt me, ask questions. Um, I will repeat them for the recording and then try and answer them. There are a few exercises to do that we'll get, get to in a minute. Uh, and to apologize in a, a sense because we have an hour and a half or so this afternoon to explain a framework that is enormous. Um, we won't be able to cover everything. Uh, so, in fact, the, the structure of this tutorial is an extract of a course that my colleagues and I run. We, we run training courses as part of our free software consultancy. And so we give GStreamer training courses to companies that are a week long or two weeks long. And I've tried to distill something that can fit into 90 minutes. Uh, you can imagine that's somewhat cut down. Um, I'd like to provide a little bit of background. I read a, a slide earlier that uh, in the week that said you can skip the slide about yourself, people can look it up, but there's a little bit of biography that I thought I should provide to establish some kind of GStreamer credential because I don't want you to think that I just arrived at UTS one day and started hacking on GStreamer and then thought I would explain to people about it. Um, the story is, in fact, completely different. What happened is that I arrived at UTS one day and started hacking on GStreamer, and 14 years later, I thought I would provide a tutorial on it. So, um, yeah, my, my introduction to GStreamer actually happened in Building One because in 2003, I was involved in the Sydney Linux Users Group, and we wanted to, every month we were meeting here in UTS and give, people were giving talks on all kinds of really interesting free software topics and we wanted to record them and we wanted to put them online. So we bought a video camera and back then YouTube didn't exist. The internet was a pretty vastly different space. So the first thing I tried to do was take the videotape we'd recorded each week, transfer it to my laptop and encode it and just, I, so I wanted to transfer over a DV link from a, a card and I found bugs. So I filed some patches. A year later I ended up moving to Spain to work on GStreamer full time and pretty much haven't stopped since, uh, except that these days we run our own company and, and do that. But anyway, a quick survey. Who has no idea what I, say, what I mean when I say GStreamer? Good, yes, okay, one. Uh, who has used GStreamer in some capacity to do some transformations? A few, okay, there's a few. Um, who has unwittingly used GStreamer or been subject to GStreamer? The rest of you can put up your hands because the whole, if you've watched any of the live streams from the conference, you are using GStreamer or if you've run GNOME and played a movie in Totem, you are using GStreamer. If you've sat on an airplane and watched a movie on the seat back of the aeroplane, you've probably used GStreamer. Um, if you've used a Samsung TV or a recent LG TV to watch a movie off a hard drive, you've probably used GStreamer. Uh, but, so, GStreamer is 
to throw some words at you, an open source pipeline based cross platform extensible multimedia framework. It is a set of code for juggling multimedia using an abstraction we call pipeline abstraction. It is not a media player. It is not a video codec or an audio codec or a network protocol library. It is not a tool for transcoding videos. It is not in itself a streaming server. It is a framework that people use to build all of those sorts of things. And people use it to build lots of really interesting other things as well. So the goal of GStreamer as a project and as a design principle is to retain a flexible and extensible design that is easy to use as an underlying layer in other software. So, uh, and we say it's easy to integrate with other software in both directions. That means that we aim to be easy, it, we aim to make it easy for GStreamer to take advantage of other people's software to, to integrate new features, as well as for people to build on top to create new functionality and new applications. We have a, quite a large active community, um, you know, lots of emails on the mailing list, <coughs> thousands of unfinished bug reports that need looking at, um, and a nice ecosystem of companies that are built around our open source project and providing services to help people build products if they need that, or in our case, our model is that we are GStreamer maintainers and we, four years ago, started our own company where we aim to spend three days a week getting paid by people to help them build products in order to fund two days a week of free software maintenance and general improvements to the framework and running the releases and doing the builds and all that, that kind of stuff. So it's working fairly nicely. Uh, I, I've kind of provided a list of some of the ways that the GStreamer is used uh, in my list of you know places you might have encountered GStreamer without knowing it's there. So it's a core part of the Vocto Mix framework that they use for capturing the video from all of these rooms. It's a core part of a bunch of media players. It's used by people to build video conferencing applications um, on the net on the web. Uh, there are web browsers that use GStreamer when you play your multimedia in a web context. The underlying software that is actually doing the decoding and giving back the pixels is, can, is sometimes GStreamer. Hi, Hal. So the question is, is it used for any of the mobile phone video conferencing? Things. There are no mobile phones that ship GStreamer by default anymore. Uh, there were some experiments in that direction a decade ago, but no smartphones. The Android has its own video framework and Apple have their own. However, GStreamer is a cross-platform library and we do build for iOS and for Android and there are people that are building applications in the Google Play Store or the Apple Play Store that do multimedia things like video streaming or capturing the screen or chatting and internally that'll be implemented in in GStreamer and you don't know or care. So is there some sort of signal through GStreamer that they chose to Sorry, can signal? The IM, the SMS replacement? Yep, so signal could Yes, so this is, for example, the Signal application, the, the communications application, when it's doing video conferencing, the video processing part of that could be implemented in, in GStreamer. I think they, they haven't. They've opted to do specific platform code because they're really only targeting the two platforms and they've got the manpower and the expertise to, to do it. So they've built their own stack. But they're also limited by that. They're, less extensible and there are fewer things they could do if they wanted to change the model of, of signal. So if they used GStreamer, they'd have a more free selection of, for example, switching codecs or they would get our RTP transmission improvements by default instead of having to roll their own RTP stack in. Uh, here's one cool application we saw last year. That's a Japanese space agency 
robot that they have on the International Space Station. And um, they wrote to us and said, your GStreamer software is in space. This, this robot is running GStreamer and using it to transmit the video and audio back and forth from the Earth. So this robot can, has cameras that are streaming the view from ISS and there are people on Earth that are flying the robot around to be an extra set of hands on the space station is their, their goal. They want to have a remote astronaut. So those kinds of, oh, we didn't know you were doing that. It's nice to hear about it. Uh, applications are always a bit thrilling. Uh, I will add a note here that this is less and less common, but it still comes up. We had, we've had multiple series of GStreamer through its development cycle. So when I got involved, we were doing GStreamer 0 0.6, and around 2005, we released what we called GStreamer 0 0.10, which was our big, stable release. And a lot of applications and a lot of companies shipped GStreamer 0 0.10. And it was the major development series uh, for seven years. Five, sorry, five years. 2009, we released GStreamer 1.0. Confusingly, they have similar-ish looking numbers. Um, however, GStreamer 1.0 is now where we do all our development. We no longer touch GStreamer 0 0.10. And sometimes we still see people come up and look confused and say, hey, this is, I'm trying to do this and it doesn't work and it, we waste a few minutes and then we realize, oh, you're using GStreamer 0 0.10. No one's touched that code in, in eight or nine years. Um, no wonder you're having problems. You should switch to GStreamer 1.0. So, and you still do see it sometimes in the distros. If you do a search for GStreamer in there, don't accidentally try and use the 0 0.10 version. Always make sure you're using it one of the 1 dot something series. And the current one is 1.12. So here is a picture of GStreamer's architecture. The big box in the middle is what I would actually call GStreamer. It's the, the core of GStreamer is a library that provides an architecture for plugging components together and streaming data through those components. It provides the data transport, it provides primitives for negotiating which data types each element is going to talk, uh, it provides the communications channels for talking to applications, it provides primitives for synchronizing media and some base classes and that's it. There's no multimedia stuff there at all. All of the multimedia things come from the plugin stack that are all the boxes underneath the middle, all of the bottom row, are extensi extension modules that we plug into the GStreamer core to provide all the things you would think of as video decoders and encoders and media streaming. And on top of that, people build tools, or well, we have our GStreamer standard tools that, that we ship, and then we have a bunch of the, the yellow things the, that are the people's app, app, actual applications. Sorry. Yeah, I am missing a slide here somewhere. Ah, here, sorry. Um, in, I, ha I have put these slides and some sample code and some sample media up on GitHub, and there's a, a short URL there for people to go to. And if you want to follow along as I get to any of the examples and try them out, then there are some packages that you should install uh, if you just, if you want to follow along, then you make sure you get that short URL or the full URL copied down because then you can get all of these slides. You'll be able to get these command lines out of the readme file and you'll have each of the command lines and the, the tools that I talk about during the rest of the tutorial available. Just give you a minute to get that info and grab a thumbs up when people are sorted. If someone on every table has it, then that's probably enough. Yep, all right, so we'll carry on. Okay, so the GStreamer core provides 
for creating a hierarchy of pipelines or, um, that are what we call bins, that are containers containing elements that are the, the individual processing components and the pads that we link together to define how data is going to flow through these, these chains of elements. The data that actually flows through the, the pipeline is in the form of buffers that are the real data. So a buffer might be a frame of video or 40 milliseconds of audio samples. They are surrounded by and negotiated using events that travel in the pipeline with the, the data buffers. And we have the concept of queries for asking the pipeline questions like what is the current playback position or um, what is the duration of this media file. And messages that are sent from the pipeline up to the application to inform it about the processing that's going on. So they're, they're the, the basic names of things that I'm going to be talking about. Bins, elements inside. Bins become pipelines. So there's one top level bin that is your pipeline. You can have a stack of bins inside. And inside each bin container, you'll find elements. And those elements get linked together in order to make data flow through. Also in the GStreamer core, negotiating which data formats we are going to be transporting, primitives for scheduling data transfer and for synchronizing so that you can do audio and video playback or when you are recording audio and video that they are put into the file together and synchronized. We have a registry of extension components, the plugins that are installed on the system so that we the, so the registry tracks all the formats that have been, all the, the, the plugins that have been installed on your system and that is, defines the capabilities of your GStreamer set. And as I've, I've mentioned in the, the big diagram, the GStreamer core doesn't know anything about video and audio. There, I think, is one, one leak of that abstraction, which is tag metadata inter information. We have some definitions in the GStreamer core where we have suspicious names like composer or genre or audio and video types as, as tag defines, but otherwise, you know, there's nothing in the GStreamer core that defines a video buffer. It's completely media agnostic, which has a nice side effect that another project we, we heard about last year, um, how did that happen? Scroll, here we go, these guys, this is the, um, the LIGO observatory in the US, the Gravitational Wave Observatory. They sent us an email last year saying, hey, we detected gravity waves and we would like to say thank you because we could not have done it without GStreamer. We're like, what? Like they use GStreamer not to do any multimedia processing. They use it as a data processing framework and they have built instead of elements that decode video and encode video. They built elements that analyze sensor data from the observatory and they connect them together in different pipelines to run experiments on their data to, to try out different analyses and test hypotheses. And they're like, we found gravity waves in that data because we could run GStreamer simulations in 50 different ways really quickly on all the observations we got. We're like, well, that's finally a good reason for us to have kept the core media agnostic. That's nice. <laughs> All right, so these are what elements in GStreamer might look like. There's some simple ones in the top row. We have a source element that is going to generate some data in some way, and it has a source pad. And next to that, and so it has one source pad. It's going to only output data. In the middle, we have a filter that can both receive data and send. And at the end, we have a sync that is, only has an input pad and will only receive information. So data always flows from a source in the pipeline to a sync. A chain that doesn't have a sync on the end is considered unlinked and will shut down when the first buffer reaches an unlinked pad. 
and you won't get any more data flow after that. And there are different kinds of pads because we have different scenarios for data flow. So you have fixed elements that, have a, that always have a pad. So that's what we mean. We say always, we have an always pad. This is, as soon as you create the element, that always present pad will be there and you can connect it. And then you have elements that might not know how many streams of data they are outputting until they start receiving something. So when you start playing a, an MP4 file off your hard drive, you don't know does it have video in it? Does it have video and audio? Does it have video and five languages? So the element that is unpacking the MP4 container and extracting the raw video and audio streams in there won't know how many pads to output until it starts to receive some data and look at the file. So we have a demuxer element there that is the unpacking element and it has sometimes present pads that it will create at runtime and inform you about their presence. Conversely, you have a situation where you are um, writing data out to a file, and so you, are, you have some video and audio, you want to mux it together in, in, into an MP4 file. You have to tell the element how many streams you are going to be giving it. So we say those are request pads. You request a certain number of pads from the element. It's not in control of it, the application is in control. So we have sometimes pads where the element is in control of the creation and we have request pads where the application is in control of the pad creation. And this abstraction is kind of like um, putting ICs on a PCB. Right? The, the building blocks are circuit elements and the pads are, so, are pads on an IC that we're going to be joining together to define the flow in the circuit. All right, so source pads produce data, and so data flows from a source to a sink. We call the, the elements a source element, and we call the pads a source pad. So there's a bit of overlapping technology that, you, that it should be careful not to confuse. So I, often I'll interchangeably talk about a source and I might mean a source element or I might mean a source pad and hopefully it's clear from the context. Otherwise, please ask. Does anyone have any questions about that abstraction? I, I, I'm hoping it'll become clearer with some more content soon, but if you've got any questions, please go ahead. The, so the question is, what is the overhead of GStreamer in processing the data? Uh, there is some, but it's not, we, we find it's not very high. So when we compare, for example, a GStreamer media player against something that is more hardwired, like a direct FFmpeg connection or mPlayer playing a movie, we get profiling results that are within 1% kind of things. So it's, you know, it's in the noise almost. The, in, there are pipelines where the overhead can become significant, it is true. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen pipeline graphs with 100 video conferencing participants. So you have hundreds and hundreds of elements and hundreds of pads cooperating and the th the thread scheduling overhead and things can become significant then, but for most playback cases, GStreamer is not the, the bulk of the CPU, it's the processing that it's doing on the data tends to dominate, as long as the buffers are of reasonable size. If you try to process your audio in one millisecond chunks, then you've increased the buffer rate artificially almost, you know, people, people tend to use buffers that are slightly larger in size than, than that. Okay. So you have some elements in a pipeline, you've, you've connected them together 
in some way, we haven't really shown the, the primitives for connecting, but we've said you you've create links between the pads. And now you've got a graph of processing components and the links between them. The, the way we then start data flow in GStreamer is using uh, uh, states metaphor. So uh, uh, elements start in the null state when you first create them. And the only, it says they occupy no resources. They, they of course, there's a, an object in memory and a, a structure. But the idea is that elements should not have files open. They should not have allocated video decoder processing buffers or anything in the null state. They should be as small and, and they should be inert. Until the pipeline or the application sets that to the ready state, in which case, for example, a file source will now open a handle to the file and be ready to start streaming data. So ready state is open your video decoder hardware that, or allocate memory buffers or open your file handles. Then we move to the paused state and now the pipeline is actually processing data. So we have a paused state and a playing state in which the pipeline will really be processing. And the only difference in GStreamer between paused and playing is what happens when data reaches a sync at the end of the chain. So in the paused state, you, you read from a file, you run it through a demuxer, you unpack the video and the audio stream, you decode the video and the audio, and eventually you get a raw video buffer and some audio and you deliver those down to the elements that are going to be displaying or, or rendering the audio. And this is the only difference now between paused and playing. At that point, a sync element in paused will hold onto the buffer and not display it yet. A sync element in the playing state will display the buffer and go back to get more. So in paused, we run data all the way to the end and we pre-roll the pipeline and we have it primed with decoded data and it's now ready to go to the playing state in minimum possible time. Do you keep running the data in that pause state, or do you simply stop at that point? I ask because there may be other system processes which may demand resources. So the, the pipeline will process until everything in the pipeline is blocked. And the first thing that will block is the sync element will not render buffers. However, there might be some queuing internally where we say we want a couple of frames ready to go. So we might decode a second frame and have it ready in a, a buffer as well. So yeah, the pipeline can keep processing a little bit longer, but it will quiesce when all of the internal buffering is now full and it says there's no more space, there's no more work to do until a frame gets shown. And at that point, it'll stop in most scenarios. It depends on the pipeline which is an answer I can give a lot. Everything depends on the pipeline because the core is completely media agnostic. So if you are playing a live video stream and you put it in the paused state, the data is not going to stop coming off the network. You still have to do something with it at the receiver side, whether it's you know throw it away or whatever. So there are some pipelines where things happen anyway, even in paused. But to keep it simple, if you're playing a file, you'll get to paused when a video frame gets to the end and then it'll stop and wait until it's told to go to playing. Uh, we always go through each state change step by step, so we never skip. So we always go null, ready, paused, and then we're ready to go to playing. And there's a distinction there at the, in the last couple of lines when you're going up through the state hierarchy to, towards playing. That is an asynchronous operation. So if an application says, hey, pipeline, play, that call returns immediately and the processing starts happening in the background and the application can get on with whatever it was doing. Later, it will get a notification that the pipeline has reached the playing state, but it doesn't block waiting for that to happen. On the other hand, downwards state changes back to null are always synchronous. So when an application says pipeline stop and go to the null state now, that function call won't return until the pipeline is really shut down and ready to be thrown away. Which means when, you, when it's time to quit, you don't need to, t 
tell it to quit, wait for it to quit, and then get around to quitting. You can just shut the pipelines down and go. Um, you will encounter fairly quickly the GStreamer registry uh, of plugins. Uh, if you've started running those command lines I sent, then you've installed a bunch of plugins on your system, and they provide all of the functionality for actually processing media. And what happens is when you start a GStreamer application, you call the GST init function, and it runs a function to update the registry and scan all the plugins on the system. And it does a, a stat of all the, the plugin files in the directories. It looks for any ones that have changed since the last scan, and it probes them for available features if anything has changed builds that into what we call the registry of, of plugins and then serializes that information out to disk so that it's cached and the startup is quicker the next time. Um, there are different features that plugins can provide. So we have elements that can perform some particular processing on data and we have type finder functions that can look at an incoming data stream and try and recognize what it is. So we have a type finder function that looks at a stream and says, this looks like an MP3, or this looks like a JPEG. So we, we match. When, we, when you ask, it, we ask a GStreamer to play an unknown file, it decides how it's going to play that by looking at the actual content of the file and, and a heuristic that looks at the extensions, but we don't trust extensions by default. If you get an MP3 file, a, a .mp3, but it actually contains MP4 data with MP3 in it, we can still play it correctly by recognizing that it's got a container wrapped around it. We have these, yeah, there are other features listed there, device monitors for finding out about hardware on the system and um, some debugging stuff that plugins can register. We cache them in a file on the file system. That is an important optimization because we have a lot of plugins. Uh, on my laptop, it's on the order of 250 plugins, and we don't, do not want to open all of those and load them into memory if all you want to do is quickly play one type of file. So the registry is a, an important optimization for making sure we don't load more stuff into memory than you need at runtime. Uh, however, we can also support the use case where you know exactly what your playback or streaming scenario is. You know exactly which video formats you want to support, and you don't want the overhead of loading dynamic libraries at runtime to load those. So you can statically link the things into one blob and for example on an Android application that's the only way we can work. We we ship a, because we can't DL open a whole bunch of stuff and write a registry easily on Android so we build a dynamic, we build one native library for your Android Java app to use and we statically link all the plugins into there. It gives you smaller binary sizes on those kinds of platforms. Right. So the, fir the, fundament the first fundamental tool that you'll probably want to encounter in GStreamer, one of our standard tools that comes from the GStreamer core is called GST Inspect. And it is the tool for finding out what is installed on your system, uh, what plugins do you have. So there's some examples there. If you just run GST Inspect, you get all of the list all the, all the plugins that are installed on your system. So I have 242 plugins and they are exporting one and a half thousand features. Or I can, a feature is either a processing element or a type finder function or, uh, you know, the, the other things I listed, the device monitors and, and whatnot. Oh, you can run GST inspect dash A and it will open, it will, it will introspect all of those and give you the full breakdown of everything that you have installed on your system. 
which is um, 120k worth of no, 123,000 lines of information on my laptop. So, so that's a fair chunk of information. You can run GST inspect on a particular .so file for a plugin and just find out what's in that, which is useful if you are building your own plugins and they're not installed on the system yet. You can directly inspect a .so file and check that it's exporting what you think it should be exporting. Or you can inspect by the names of plugins on the system or the names of elements or features that are on the system directly. The output looks something like this. So if you inspect the core elements plugin, the, the fundamental plugin that the GStreamer core provides, you'll see something like this. It tells you a description of that plugin, the location of the, the dynamic library that's providing it, the version number of the build, which license the plugin is declaring. What, what happens if it, the features are overlapping? How do you choose? We, one of the pieces of information in the plugin output, so if I, if I, so this is, this is the output from a plugin and the bottom part of this is saying which elements are provided by this plugin and I've just put the first three bit, but there are more inside this core elements plugin. One of the Ones, one of the elements that's inside this plugin is called identity and there's an example of the output for identity here and it tells you that it is called identity, it has a class that says what type of data processing this provides and that's a freeform string or it's a, uh, a freeform string with a convention for what it should look like. Description, authors, and critically for your question, a rank. And plugins with the highest rank are chosen first. And that rank is set manually by the developers based on the quality of the plugin. So if we have more than one candidate, we say this is the one we know works the best. We'll make that the primary selected one and we will make the others secondary in case the person doesn't have access to that plugin. We'll try that one. That's the secondary ranking one. And if they're all primary ranked, which you know the people that wrote them have assessed that they are of sufficient quality to be used by default in every case, if we have multiple primary ranked ones, we go alphabetically. <laughs> OK, so now you have a way of finding out what's installed on your system. The next tool that you will encounter if you start doing GStreamer processing is called GST Launch. And GST Launch is a tool that takes a description of a pipeline that is expressed in a simple language and that describes what elements should be created and how they should be linked together. Uh, we consider it mostly a debugging tool but we see people building entire GStreamer-based systems where they are only using GST launch pipelines. Its, its primary caveat is that it's, you run a GST launch line and it's a fixed pipeline. You don't have any flexibility or hooks to control it after that. So you can set up one data flow and process things, but you can't control the data flow on the fly and you can't respond to errors except by having it exit that sort of thing. So there are a couple of easy steps beyond GST launch to start actually making real applications. But we start with GST launch because you can do a lot of useful things with it. So the first most primitive example, um, GST launch dash 1.0 audio test source exclamation mark audio convert exclamation mark audio auto audio sync. So that creates three elements, an audio test source test pattern generator, a converter that knows how to transform between different audio sample formats, and an element that automatically chooses some audio output for, from what is available on your hard drive. 
And I can hear some people running the pipeline there. Boo. Yep, that's. If you do GStreamer stuff often enough, you will learn to recognize 440 hertz at, at a moment's notice. That is correct. Um, so that is a, that's a simple pipeline that generates audio. And you hear the, the beep. We look at making that a bit more sophisticated in a minute. So pe hopefully people have found in the repository this command lines dot text that provides a quick cut and paste test. And that generates an audio test signal. You can do the same with video. So the, the next line in the thing, you replace the word audio with the word video everywhere and you'll get a similar result. But now it's generating a video test pattern. Oh, you can. We're starting, these are baby steps. <laughs> All right, elements have API for you to interact with them. Elements can have properties. Uh, I, I should perhaps explain that GStreamer depends heavily on a library called GObject that grew out of GNOME. And GObject is a object orientation library that is built entirely in C. And anyone that's done any GNOME programming or written a GTK application will have seen GObject. But anyone that hasn't and has only worked in C++ or Java will be absolutely horrified. GObject lets you declare object types and you give them properties that are settings you can you can make on the object configuration settings. And they have signals that produce callbacks or are method calls into the object. And they pretty much sum up the, what, the API that we use from, from GObject. You have elements which are GObjects underneath, and they have properties that you can use to configure them. And they have signals that fire or can be called into by the application to get the element to do things. But that's the only API that you have for talking to all these features and plugins that are installed on your system. So they, we don't have extra header files. If you install a new video decoder, it doesn't put header files that are called by you or by GStreamer. All of the API is uniformly exposed through GObject abstractions. The only header files you talk to are GStreamer libraries and GStreamer header files. That creates some limitations sometimes, but in general we found it's pretty powerful and extensible and means that when you want to write a generic application, you know the shape of the items your application is going to be trying to talk to. And if people install new plugins, your application can use them without really needing to think about it. Um, how, however, there are, diff there are situations where you do need to know specifically which element you're talking to because you want to do a particular piece of functionality. So the properties that are pro exposed by an element are entirely up to that element. And they are introspectable using GST inspect. So if you choose something like the audio test source and you have a look at it in GST inspect, you scroll down and you'll see the pad information that, that tells you all the formats this element might produce on its source pad. And it tells you the properties that you can set and configure. So for example, there is a wave property on the audio test source that you can change the type of noise it's going to make. And there is a frequency signal, so you can create a musical instrument if you choose to. Uh, so you can, you can do something simple like audio test source. And you can say, 
that the wave you want it to produce is a saw wave instead and get a very different sound. And you can say that you want to go up an octave. That, that's the audio test source. Any of these elements, if you want to find out what properties you can configure, you can look at them in GST inspect and see. So audio convert, for example, by default, will just, it will choose, a, it will do conversions between, say, 16-bit audio or 24-bit audio and convert it to match whatever is the requirements of the element on either side of it. But you have some properties for affecting how those conversions might be done. So if you, are, if you need to drop the number of bits per sample from 24 down to 8-bit, you can control how much dithering is it going to apply rather than just truncating, for example. Hal, you had a question? If you wanted to use GST launch to do it, that's probably a bad idea, but sorry, the question is how, what's the, the, late up, the startup latency uh, of a GST launch pipeline if you wanted to try and create a musical instrument by scripting different frequencies out of audio test source. It's not terrible, especially once it's in hot in, in cache. If I, oh, what can I do? I can. I can do this pipeline, but I will do num buffers equals zero to say, cancel, you know, end as soon as you output zero buffers. And the total execution time was 0.1 millisecond right, for the whole application on a fast laptop with a SSD and everything in memory already. So that, with what, in, in 100? Microseconds, we've loaded the registry and created the elements and we're ready to run and then we shut down again. If I change it to one buffer, it will be a bit longer because the buffer, the audio buffers we're producing are um, 20 milliseconds long. So we've played one buffer of audio. You heard a very brief beep and then we shut down again in, in 25 milliseconds. But if you were going to create a musical instrument, you wouldn't do it by scripting GST launch. In a shell script, you would write an application that creates a pipeline with some audio test sources in it and changes their frequencies at the right moment to generate the sounds you wanted to generate, in which case you have no startup latency. You just have the pipeline processing stuff. Sorry? And that's really quick. Really quick, yep. Uh, what did we do? We had, we had one example app we were working on last year for testing how quickly we can switch languages in a video file. So we had a video file with eight languages. And a thing that was changing, as soon as it changed language, change it again. Just cycle through the channels. And the audio you heard was incomprehensible because it's changing language mid-syllable about 50 times a second or something. It's, you know, you're, you're hearing eight languages smeared together. At and that's done with dynamic pipeline switching. OK, so you have properties are the first thing you'd want to configure on your, your pipeline. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave signals for now because I talk about those again in a minute. Uh, did the GST inspect. All right, so I've done this already as well. We set properties and we can change what GST launch is going to produce. You can look at GST inspect to see them. There's a question there. What happens if you try and set deliberately wrong things or values that are outside the expressed range? And you can probably guess what happens. You would, so if I go back here and I go audio test source and I try and set wave equals 
pony. Right? There is no pony wave in our audio test source. Please file a patch. You asked, can't you, can you do both together? So the last point here, try doing audio and video in the same pipeline, and what happens? So if I do an audio test source and a video test source, and I... So I have just put both pipeline strings together, but I haven't joined them together with an exclamation mark, so there's no link between those. There's just two separate independent chains in the pipeline doing their own thing but running in the same place. And if I did try and link them together like that, it would tell me it couldn't link those two elements together. The same if I erroneously try and run audio into a video converter, it tells me I couldn't link those together. There's no common format for those. Unless I try and do, for example, uh, sorry, it's kind of hard typing on a TV across the room. So we have some audio visualizers there if I do, for example, space scope. And then, oh, that's a really boring scope, isn't it? There we go. That's better. So now I can play audio and I can play some pink noise into a visualizer that converts it into a video stream, and then I can put the video out to a, an output. I'll get rid of that beep, I think, though. That's a bit annoying. So there, you can just, you, you can see it complained when I tried to do audio straight into the video chain, but by running it through that visualizer element, whose properties are available in GST Inspect, and I can see that it has a sync pad that receives 16-bit little Indian audio with two channels in it of any sample rate, and it outputs BGR X, so four bytes per pixel BGR video. And this works well, just automatically, nicely. It's selecting common formats. It's selecting some typical sort of defaults. There. Okay. Right. How's the level? Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, so, pads have to be compatible in direction. So, source pads have to link to sync pads. And they have to have formats in common. They are being played synchronized, but they're not being generated synchronized, so there's no real way to tell. But after 10 seconds, both parts of that pipeline will have played 10 seconds of the content they've created. And uh, you know, it is, it is still outputting in lockstep. No. Yes and no. There's more. There's more. 
I, I talk about synchronization fairly shortly, so I'll cover it in a bit in more detail. Uh, when, you when elements create pads, they create them from, the, from things we call pad templates. So a pad template describes all the possible formats that a, an element can support, and it's actually pad templates that you're looking at when you use GSD inspect. So the ele elements publish templates that say, here are all the possible things I might be able to process. So a video decoder, for example, m on its source pads, it may list many formats that it could possibly output because it, mo it might not know until some video arrives and we start decoding it, is this actually 420 video, is this 422 video, the, the output format will be defined by the content it's receiving. So the pad template will be a superset of the actual format being processed at runtime. So when you use GST inspect, you'll see all of the pad templates that is the declaration of everything that might happen and that this element might be capable of. But the real answer is not until you start to link them together at runtime and they try and negotiate formats. So we had some simple failures in my command line here of it immediately complained that it couldn't do this pipeline because it can look at the pad templates for the audio test source and the video convert and it can know straight away these are never going to be compatible. You can also have failures at runtime when you go to pro play a file and you get runtime negotiation errors that are a bit trickier to handle, uh, but you'll see hopefully some, well not today, but if you, if you do start using GStreamer, you can see some ways to cope with that. So what do our media format descriptions actually look like? So we call those caps. The, the caps to define what format is being transferred. And a caps is a structure type, a GStreamer specific structure with a media type at the start and a set of properties after that. And these structures are very flexible in being able to declare that you can have a width, which is a range of values, and you can have a on the other side, so you can have two elements that declare a set of widths that, a uh, video width that they might be able to process. And the GStreamer core is able to take the caps from both elements and find the, the set of intersecting compatible formats and then choose from within those what the actual data is that is going to be transferred. So there's a breakdown here. If we are playing an H.264 stream, the caps will look like this. They start with a video slash X H.264 string, and that's a freeform string that we, we have some conventions for what they should look like, but also new plugins and applications are free to invent their own caps types, which leads to things like LIGO, where they've invented their own caps to describe the data they're transferring around. And the properties are also an arbitrary list of, of a name for the property, a type that the property has, and a value. So yeah, we've got a width of 1920, a height of 1080. We're saying that this H.264 is, is particularly formatted as a byte stream. So each packet has a 001 header on it and the buffers, are the, the, the data that is transferred in a single GStreamer buffer corresponds to one access unit of H.264 video, and this video conforms to the specification level five and is 25 frames per second. So you can have caps that are simple and define a particular fixed value or you can have complex caps with multiple lists of formats in them and multiple possible data types. So we, d we split caps up into fixed and unfixed caps. And unfixed caps just d define a range of possible formats we can process. Fixed caps are what we have to reach before you can actually do any data processing. So we have to be able to resolve all of the caps in a pipeline down to be a fixed value to say this is actually what is being transferred. So we can't 
process a pipeline if we're saying, oh, this might be stereo or it might be mono. The, the, at, at some point, the core will choose one if the elements don't express a preference, and then it will say, right, you're processing stereo, you two, stop it. We also have some special ones. We can have the any caps, that is, I don't care, I can process anything, and you see some generic elements in the GStreamer core that can really process any caps, like the identity element it doesn't care whether it's passing buffers of video or buffers of audio, it's just passing data buffers. So it negotiates using any as its declared caps. And you can have the empty set, which is the when you have intersections that lead to no possible result. You, you have no interact, intersecting compatible formats. And you can do set operations on GStreamer caps. And additionally, they have in this example, an extra set of things in brackets after the media type that we call f caps features for more advanced use cases. So in this case, this caps feature expresses that we are passing raw video data of 1920 by 1080, but the buffers that are transferring this data are actually OpenGL textures rather than raw memory buffers. So we can express different kinds of memory storage and we can pass around opaque buffers between hardware decoder instances in, in embedded systems. Um, you know, we, can, we can handle cases where you are transferring some data flow and you are triggering operations on them but they're not really memory buffers and the software can't see them and you're not allowed to look at the memory. You're just allowed to hand it to some API to do stuff. We have naming conventions that you will need to learn. If you start extending GStreamer, you'll see these fairly readily. But if you're just plugging elements together, you probably don't care. Um, I think this is probably an advanced concept that you can, you can revisit if you've got some GStreamer stuff happening. We see caps in the GST inspect. There's a bulb, another example there. Oh, here's another tool. Oh gosh, we're at five to five already. Um, GST type find. So I mentioned that we sniff what's in files to decide what the media format is, what the stream is that we're actually processing. You can use the GST type find tool to do that same function on any media files you might have lying around and see what GStreamer thinks is the, the data in that file. Sometimes we have bugs that are related to incorrectly detecting what the content is, um, which we call the everything looks like an MP3 file rule because the MP3 file format is so simple and generic that if something doesn't look like another specific format, the MP3 file detector claimed it for, you know, we've had to put all kinds of extra sophisticated checks into the MP3 sniffer just to stop it becoming a fallback. All right, so uh, some, uh, an example about how to do caps. Let's go back to the video pipeline. So when I run that video test source pipeline from before. What pops up is a 320 by 240 video. That's the default negotiated size in the absence of any other information. Uh, if we want to change what format we're processing, we will use what we call a caps filter. And you can either create a caps filter element or we have a shortcut where you can express caps just in line in your pipeline and have GStreamer create a caps filter in there. So it starts with the type that you want to process and you express some constraint on 
what the video caps should be. So instead of 320 as a default fallback, which is what has happened when we have video convert that can take any format, a video sync that can take anything up to 16K video, and a test source generator that can generate video of any resolution, GStreamer Core has chosen 320 by 240. But we can say we would rather you pick a width of 1920, and it will pick 1920 by 240. Or we can say, right, we really want you to do 1280 and a height of 720. will generate 1280 by 720 video, which is being downscaled slightly b to fit onto my display. We can also add the dash V parameter to our GST launch line and it will print a bunch of information about which formats are being processed in the pipeline from start to finish. So we can see that in this case it's now chosen 1920 by, two f by 720, sorry, 1280 by 720. It's using YV12 as the buffer format. It's chosen 30 frames per second, one square pixels. It's, n it's not interlaced and it's not stereoscopic. So there are other f properties in these caps that we could also modify. We could tell it we want you to be processing RGB video and the test source generator will make RGB frames instead and they will be passed through the video converter and the video sync oh the video sync didn't want uh, didn't want um, RGB so what we find has actually happened is video convert on its source pad is producing YV12 again, but it's receiving RGB. So it's doing a software frame format conversion in order to make sure that the video still plays. Uh, any questions about caps? So the first question is, does the application know anything, does the GST launch application know anything about multiple monitors? And being able to express that you want the window in a particular place split across two screens, uh, to which the answer is no. In general, GStreamer doesn't know anything about your desktop environment or the screen split. That's Sorry. Uh, so the, in general, GStreamer doesn't know about monitors or where the window is. That's application level stuff, really. So you build an application, you embed a GStreamer display somewhere into it, and it's probably your GTK or Qt win, um, toolkit or iOS widgets or Android that are interacting with your actual desktop environment to decide how you want to display things and where and GStreamer just does what it's told at that point. Um, and the second question is what about things like HDR support? There is not currently HDR support. A couple of years ago I did a project to add 3D stereoscopic support and there are some HDR things in the pipeline, but it would be nice if people had a real concrete need for HDR processing, um, if they helped push it. The limit of our HDR processing is that our video formats do support high bit depth frame formats. So you can pass through 10 bit and 12 bit <laughs> video frames but we don't do anything like Dolby Vision mixing or that, that kind of stuff yet. Switch back to that one. 
quite something new. Yeah, it's, it's more convenient than remembering to lean into the left turn. Testing, testing. How's your, how's your level? You okay? A little, more a little bit more. Uh, well, I will be doing more when I'm talking back at the room. So. Uh, okay, so here is a picture of the different ways that an application communicates with the GStreamer pipeline. And there, there are four mechanisms for getting information in and out of the, the pipeline that are not so there's a, there's a fifth as well in that we can also export the actual data buffers for you to process. But if you are just running an application that creates a GStreamer pipeline to do some processing and then you want to control starting and stopping or tr listening to, for some events that are happening in your media stream, then we have four mechanisms for that. The first is the signals that are implemented as a G object primitive and they are simply a callback. You register for a callback and when an event happens, your, the signal, sorry, when something happens in the pipeline, I shouldn't use the term event because we use the term event for an actual piece of API. When something happens in the pipeline, it can trigger a signal. So for example, the spectrum analysis element will fire a signal when it has a new piece of information about spectral data. And signals sit right next to what we call messages in GStreamer that also travel from the pipeline up to the application. And the big difference between the two is that signals are synchronous and are a callback that occurs from a GStreamer processing thread. And your application, when receiving a signal, has to know that the code might be called from any random thread at any time. And you, so you have to worry about locking. We've gradually moved away from signals towards sending messages. And the, the difference is that messages travel through a bus object that marshals them back into the main thread. So you can retrieve messages from the bus at whatever point of your, your application processing it's convenient to do so. And then you can handle the messages. So the main difference is which thread you get to handle things in and we generally find that it's more convenient for applications to handle messages off the bus than it is to handle signals from a, a background thread. The other big difference is that signals can travel into the pipeline as well because uh, as well as being a callback from a G object, a signal can be a trigger for a G object to, to do something. So you, you will find, for example, that we might have a signal on the, there's an element that while recording a file, it periodically will close the file and start a new one. There is a signal you can call to trigger a switch to a new file outside of, so you can set parameters to say when it's time to switch to a new file, but there's also a signal that says do it now. So that's a call into the pipeline as well as a call back out of the pipeline. We have events that are a request for the pipeline to do something. And events are the red lines. You can see events also travel within the pipeline and they're sent back and forth between elements, but they're, they're also sent from the application. So an application might send an event like a seek event that is a request to move to a new playback position in a, play, in a file. Or an event will be an end of stream event that says playback is finishing now. So an application can cause playback to finish by sending an end of stream, or the pipeline will naturally perhaps generate an end of stream at the moment when you reach the end of playing a file. And the fourth abstraction we have is a query, which is a question asked of the pipeline, like what is the playback position? Or how many bytes have you written to the file so far? 
in normal GStreamer fashion, all of these things are quite extensible. So messages, events, and queries all just carry the same sort of freeform structure property bag that, are, that is used for caps. So they're very, very extensible and defined as needed by the elements and the applications. So the fourth example here is to, we already, we, I added the dash V parameter to my last command line so that we can start to see what caps are being chosen in the pipeline. If I also add M to that, we will see the messages that are being forwarded from the application, from the pipeline up to the application to tell it what's happening. So you'll see a good amount of extra information in the output now. So this is a message from the video sync saying that its state has changed. It was in the ready state. It is now in the paused state. And it has no more state change currently pending. Sometime later, the, the GST launch application announces, OK, everyone is now in the paused state. That means the pipeline is pre-rolled, and I will set it to playing. And then we will see some more messages start to come from the pipeline now that it's been told to go to the playing state. So we'll see it's now picked a clock to time its playback with. And the elements start reporting, my state has changed. Now I've gone from paused to playing. Later, when I hit Control C, you know, uh, on Control C on the downward, you don't see messages coming out because we go to null very quickly and flush the, the remaining messages. But uh, so, can you find all the different messages and events in the output? What else do you see? Some things you can look at there. So I've mentioned threads because it's impossible to talk about GStreamer without mentioning threads at some point. GStreamer relies very heavily on threads. As soon as you ask a pipeline to go to the playing state, GStreamer is creating threads in the background to actually do the processing. And free, your application thread is free to carry on doing whatever it wants, and GStreamer will create threads in the background to actually process the data. And there is an object, uh, an element in our set called the queue. And there's a few different queues for different buffering information. So a queue is an element that does two things. One, it stores some amount of buffers internally to decouple the flow in a pipeline. So it can store a set of data buffers temporarily, and you can set constraints on how many of those it should store in you know, up to one second of data or one megabyte of data. You can set constraints in size and in time. And the second thing that queues do is to they decouple the pipeline by creating a new thread on the output. So the data is received in one thread, stored internally, and there is a second thread trying to push downstream. So every time you see a queue in a GStreamer pipeline, there's another thread involved in the processing. That's an evolution. Uh, that's the abstraction we came up with the, the, with the GStreamer 0 0.10 release series after struggling, uh, what, six or seven years. People struggled with writing schedulers that used coroutine type approaches and tried to do scheduling in fewer threads using GStreamer as the marshaller and around 2005, working mostly on Linux, we just decided it was too hard to do that right. The overhead of the kernel scheduling switches is low enough and the kernel is designed for scheduling tasks. So we'll just hand it all off and we will create as many threads as we need and we will let the kernel do its job of figuring out the scheduling for us. It's Sometimes leads to way too many threads, so it's you know it's a, a limited approach, but it generally has worked out pretty well, and ties in really well with the goal of pulling in 
other people's libraries where we have no idea about what they're doing internally for their scheduling or how long a call might block. It's hard to implement coroutines if you need to be over there doing something within a few milliseconds, but you don't know how long this library you're depending on might chew up your CPU for. If you put them in separate threads, you can just context switch. Do you have a question? So does the, the reliance on threads lead to having uh, to a need for real-time kernels? In general, not, because machines are fast enough that I, we find you can do your processing without needing to worry too much about thread latency in most situations. So, you know, standard kernels work fine for every processing task I've tackled. However, we have seen people building particular products where they do end up wanting to hook into the GStreamer thread creation and manage them themselves to make particular threads be real-time priority or higher priority or particular CPU affinity, for example. So there are hooks to give control of that kind of thing if it's necessary. But it's generally premature optimization to try and do it too early. All right, so queues are generally needed when you have elements that are receiving one stream and splitting it out into multiple streams, or when you're doing it in the other direction and you're taking multiple streams and feeding them into one. We generally have a queue in there to decouple those operations, and it's particularly important when you are doing the single stream splitting out to multiple streams as a decoupling mechanism. So we always use queues when we have a demuxer and you are parsing a, an MP4 file. That might be very badly muxed. You may find files in the wild where you have two seconds of video data followed by two seconds of the corresponding audio data. And in that case, if you want to play that file at all, somewhere in your video player, you need to be able to store two seconds of data, two seconds of video and two seconds of audio, so that you have the corresponding pieces ready to play at the same time. So cues are the decoupling element that will compensate for muxing interleave size. Uh, here is, so this is an example of exactly that situation. If you want to play a, a, an OG file, then you have an input, you use file source to read that file, it goes into a demuxer element, and the GST launch syntax gets a little more advanced here. So we've given the demuxer a name instead of letting the, the core pick an arbitrary identifier, we've said call this demuxer D, and then we've referred to that element by name in two separate branches. So we've said from one pad of the demuxer, put it into a queue, a Vorbis decoder, a converter, a resampler, and an audio output. And on the video pad, put it through a queue, a Theora decoder, a video converter, a scaler, and an auto video sync. So this will play a media file. We, we're probably going to run out of time, so I should probably skip ahead. I'll skip through data flow. Here, oh look, <laughs> clocks and synchronization. So the pipeline, when it goes to playing, picks a clock, and the clock is going to be used to time presentation of material, and it's used to timestamp captured media using some common reference. And the only requirement for a clock in GStreamer is that it produce timestamps somehow in nanoseconds, because we always timestamp in nanoseconds, and that time should go forward. There is no requirement for a clock to always be running, except that it has to be running when the pipeline is playing. And that means that we do things like if you do 
media playback. Normally, the clock that we follow for playing media is the sound card and the number of samples that have been output by the sound card is converted into a nanoseconds range and so when we are playing samples, i.e. when we're in the playing state, the audio clock will increment according to how much data has been played and the video will be presented at the appropriate moments to match the audio. So sync elements can generate well, any element in the pipeline can offer a clock if it has a way of generating time or the pipeline will choose to use the system POSIX clock if there's no other preference expressed and then sync elements at the end of the pipeline use that clock to time the presentations they're making and by using a common set of, well, using a complicated ab abstraction for timelines we make sure that even video and audio where the timestamps might be different but you want them, them to play in sync, we can express an alignment and it reaches the end of the pipeline and is presented like that. Uh, it's an unfortunate, uh, another unfortunate overlap in, in terminology that I can make sentences like Syncs will play the media in sync according to the clock by talking about synchronization and syncs. We, we use the same sound, which can be a bit confusing. So we say there is a property on sync elements that is called sync, S Y N C, whether to synchronize. And if you set the sync property on a sync to true, then they will synchronize to the clock. If you set it to false, they will play media as fast as, as it is presented. And if you want to really understand how GStreamer does that presentation, then you, this is all in the PDF in the, the repo you can review at your leisure. Uh, so example number five, there is a, a little snippet in this repo called Cool Dance that is a video we recorded in 2005 when we first started generating Og Fiora. And it's over here on my... This is called Cool Dance. There we go. The cool dance that you do when you finally get Og Fiora um, encoding and muxing working. And it's the same pipeline I just put into the the slide there, manually expressing a pipeline for playing a, an Ogtheora file. And if I change sync equals false on both of these, you'll see something a little bit strange, I think. The vi see, the video is now super stuttery and the sound is the same. because they're no longer synchronizing to the clock, but the audio card still plays audio samples at the same speed, but now we are racing to throw ahead video, uh, to throw away video as fast as possible. We're not getting smooth playback anymore. We're getting whatever is the most recent video frame at the next opportunity to display. We will show that one. And if I get rid of the audio stream so that we're only playing the video, and turn off synchronization. It goes very fast, probably too fast to see. The window pops up and disappears. Um, it's, it's such a short video, we just, we've played all the frames before the window can actually be displayed. You would be quite correct if you look at this unwieldy pipeline and say, I don't want to have to construct a pipeline for every media file that I want to play. So of course we have, we have abstractions that use the ranks of plugins and elements like Playbin here that will automatically handle um, various playback scenarios. 
and they look through the registry and choose from the available plugins. That just died. All the screens just died. That one didn't. Ah. Did we? Yeah, everything's just turned itself off. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, it's logged itself out too. Is that, that's my call to wrap it up? Could be. Okay. All right. So it was. So we have this this overarching element called Playbin, which is a top level pipeline element that constructs a pipeline automatically internally. So it first starts by looking for an element that knows how to cope with the particular URI you've given it. So it can look for you, things that can handle. And well, so it's another function that elements can express when they're put in the registry a set of URIs that they know how to handle. So we, can, we have a HTTP element that says, I know how to do HTTP. Playbin knows how to take that and plug it to detect what type it's receiving. It connects that to a decode bin abstraction that then finds the appropriate demuxes and decoders and constructs the pipeline. And Voila, you have a player for any media you have decoders installed for. If you install new plugins, it will be able to handle new formats. And the application, so this is exactly what most GStreamer based players will be using, is just a, a playbin element internally. Playbin knows how to do network buffering, so it downloaded a bunch of data before it started playback. If it if the buffer runs dry, it will pause, buffer some more things, and then start playing again. And you can use the dash V argument to have a look at uh, the list of everything that's being created inside Playbin to make this playback happen. But again, you're still stuck in GST launch. So you can play a file programmatically you could script playing files and when it finishes the file GST launch will exit um, but, uh, there, go. So there is a step beyond that which is to start writing applications and a good first step is we have a, a function called GST parse launch where you can give it the exact string you were using with GST launch and now it will give you back a pipeline in C code or there are bindings in Python for doing the same thing. And then you've now got an application wrapped around it and you can start responding to events and whatnot. There's an example of playback.c in the repository of, of doing exactly this, creating a pipeline with a playbin element and then playing the same thing. But now you've got all the flexibility of changing URIs on the fly or playing a playlist or playing a certain amount of the file and then stopping or handling seeking to jump back and forth. Um, I think we're, we're really out of time there, which is what I thought might happen because, as I said, I'm taking a very large course and trying to cut it down to, to teach you some things, but hopefully you've learned something about the, the framework that I work on all the time. And if you are interested in, in seeing more, there are some more things in this repository, and I think there's another 15 or 20 slides to look at beyond that in the slide deck. And at the end there somewhere, you'll find my email address and Twitter handle if you do want to get in touch and 
ask any questions? Or does anyone have any questions that they would like to? One question. <laughs> the debugging the pipelines, you mentioned performance. How do you, how do you have metrics or traceability in the actual pipeline? Or? There, there is a whole debugging subsystem in GStreamer, and there are a bunch of, there are a, a different things you can use. Um, the, the most fundamental thing we, or we do when pipelines are not behaving the way we th think they should is to start turning on some debug logs. And GStreamer has very extensive debug logging that is registered. Again, it's extensible. So if you do dash dash GST debug help, then it will list all these categories of debug information that can be turned on and you can run any GStreamer application with a GST debug uh, environment variable and start, you can either say I want level six of every category of debug information or you can say I am only interested in, um, I don't know, things related to decoders, give me all of that information, things that are related to syncs, give me all of that information. Uh, and additionally, give me all categories at level three first. So every warning and error that happens and then really detailed logging about decoding and sync elements, give me all of that. So that will output a huge amount of debug log that you can then start looking for and, and we have a debug viewer in the GST DevTools repository where you can now look at a graph of clusters of debug information, is, are things happening in huge bursts. Beyond that, we also have the GST Tracer framework that is another extensible thing where plugins can register tracers and the GStreamer core provides a, a set of them and those are kind of like the dtrace idea of we have hooks and tracers can connect into different hooks to measure whatever it is they're trying to measure. So there are traces that will tell you things like how much processing time was spent in a particular element or what was the delay between a buffer entering an element and exiting an element. So we can measure CPU time and we can also use those to do, say, to detect ref count leaks as well. So you, there's a tracer that will print out every object that still exists at exit time so you can look for memory leaks. Cheers. Right. Thank you very much for coming along to my tutorial. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you.